We know that all life began in water, but how did it move to land? This is one of the most fundamental questions in biology, and the answer turns out to be very, very small. The first plants on Earth were algae that lived in water. But for plants to move from water to land, the algae needed to tolerate drier conditions. Professor Michael and Dr. Barbara Marconi have found an alga whose ancestor may have been one of the first to make the move to land. So when we did the molecular analysis of this alga, we found that it was related to land plants, actually the closest living relative. And then because it occurs in a terrestrial habitat, we might learn something from the genome sequencing about how life moved from water to a terrestrial habitat. And actually, what we found was even more surprising because we found that some of the genes that are present in land plants and that help the land plants to survive in a terrestrial habitat are also present in this alga. So the common ancestor of this alga and land plants already had the same genes. But the question was, where did these genes come from? Because they are not present in any other alga. And we found out that bacteria donated this gene in a process that we call horizontal gene transfer. This alga turned out to be a species first discovered in France in 1845, but never properly scientifically described until now. Michael and Barbara have classified it as Spirogloia musicola. DNA analysis showed it is extremely closely related to land plants. This is the exact spot where we found Spirogloia. And we will take some samples from different parts of this area. As you can see, some are more bright, exposed to light, and others are more dark. And what you can also see is a raindrops falling down from the top. So this is a really wet place. And if we go down here, you can see some algae, these little spots here. These are the algae you're looking well, for? Well, this I don't know. We have to do the microscopy, but it could be. I think Barbara can also now take some samples. Careful. Okay. So every different looking part gets a separate, a separate bag. And this is different. I'll take something from here. You're saying it's different because it's more It looks wet. different. Yeah, it, it looks different. So maybe we also want to, to get one other sample because you see that the, the droplets come down. Let's try to get some of the droplets from here, for example. Once the samples are collected, photographic evidence is also taken and everything is catalogued, recording time and location. So why is finding the gene of this bacteria in this alga so important? What was believed since the evolutionary theory was formulated first was that the genes just change in small steps. However, when you move whole genes from one unrelated organism to another, you generate novelty, new functions and that could help organisms to adapt to new environments, for example, to a terrestrial environment. This horizontal gene transfer is like genetic engineering of food crops, where genes from one species are incorporated into another to give them new abilities like drought tolerance. These discoveries take a huge amount of efforts from scientists all over the world and many have come together in a 10KP project. 10KP project is called the 10,000 Plant Genome Project. It was initiated during the 19th International Botanical Congress, which was held in 2017 in Shenzhen, China. And during that time, uh, the botanists who were attending 
agreed that they would sequence the genomes of 10,000 plants. And uh, our group is responsible for the coordination of the algal part of that project. At the Max Planck Institute in Cologne, Michael and Barbara have a huge number of algae they have collected for study and to use in the 10KP project. Today, we're analyzing the samples we collected to see if they contain our alga. This is the cell that I hope to isolate, and you can also see other things here. This is a moving cell that has little whips, flagella, in which they can move. This is a bacterium that moves. <laughs> Actually, oh, the tiny one. It has also, but it has also flagella, but they are too thin. Now it rotates. I don't know why. But this is the one we want to have, right? In the first round, I will use a capillary to try to pick this. But I will probably also get some of these things. And then I will wash the cell in a second round by transferring it to a fresh culture medium in a Petri dish. And then I will pick it from there into this microtiter plate here. And then we have to wait until it divides and grows. The spiral band around the algae is is chloroplast, where photosynthesis happens. As this time lapse shows, it turns itself around, allowing for all sides to be exposed to light. Michael is now going to isolate the alga using a pipette with a nozzle the width of a hair. Now I'm trying to focus on the tip. Oh, I didn't have lunch. Okay. I think you got it. I got it, yes. And you know, this is the way I have isolated thousands of strains over many decades. Once isolated, Barbara cleans the alga by pushing it through a nutrient medium known as agar removing any bacteria that could contaminate the sample. It's a job for a steady hand. I'm pushing the cells along the agar surface, thereby uh, removing some potential bacteria that could stick on the cell wall. This is a mechanical washing or scrubbing of the cell surface. So here I still have four cells. The sample is now ready to be grown in the lab next door. So, Professor, what do we have here? This is where we grow algae for harvest for the genome sequencing. Actually, they are bubbled here in these flasks with air to support their growth, to distribute them equally in the suspension and to provide carbon dioxide for their growth. As you can see, we have an LED panel that uh, supports uh, the growth by photosynthesis, and we have different algae here. We will harvest this flask today to prepare for shipment to China for sequencing. I can see different shades of green, and this one is a different color there. What's the difference? Yeah, the different shades of green reflect the different state of growth. So the ones that are lighter are younger in their growth, and the ones that are darker are ready to be harvested. And in this alga, where you see it's uh, reddish, brownish, see this? It's quite beautiful. And this is the same. Uh, this, no, this is the same alga as this one, oh. but when the nutrients are exhausted, for example, the nitrogen, which they need for growth, they transform into a resting stage. This is a terrestrial alga, so it can survive in the dry state for years. It can also fly around in the dry state with clouds or be moved around by migrating birds. And this is how the algae are distributed. This sample has been growing for some time and is now ready to be harvested. We check whether the culture is clean. That means whether there are any bacteria or not. Occasionally we see a dead cell here. Some cells are in division, some have just divided. This one has just divided, and that one is almost at cell division. 
And this culture looks perfect. The liquid is removed in the centrifuge, ready to freeze the algae for shipping. The algae are down here. Oh, wow. And that is the liquid. So they have, by gravity, 650 G. They have uh, pelleted. <laughs> The sample is now freeze-dried, ready to ship to China for genome sequencing. So how long these tubes need to stay in the nitrogen? About half a minute for each tube, mm -hmm. until it's completely frozen, the material, and then it can be stored or transferred to a low temperature freezer at minus 80 degrees centigrade, and there it can be stored for weeks or even longer. Dr. Liu Xin is a geneticist with a 10KP project based in Beijing. Why is research like this necessary? If this uh, genome of one species is known, um, there are quite a lot of different kind of studies can be designed based on the genome. Based on the genome information, the, all the other researchers can be more efficient. So um, Providing the data from providing the genome data, we think that this would uh, accelerate uh, the other researches. Uh, and also uh, using the data itself, you can directly get uh, uh, very straightforward information like for different uh, genomes. They can be different for different species. They have different genomes. You can distinguish different species. And uh, for the species, either they live in some uh, uh, specific environments, they adapted to specific environments. You can know how, why they adapted there. So what will be the social and practical implications of this research? Definitely it can help the conservation, no matter what kind of, kind of conservation uh, 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 methodology you are using. But uh, uh, the data can help you do better uh, conservation. And, and the second aspect, you can also think about uh, better usage, better uh, uh, kind of way to use the pulse. We have uh, many of them to be used as uh, the herbs. Uh, many of them have some metabolites people widely used. There are many of those kind of stamp, uh, examples. Uh, but if you have the genome, you can know better about why and you can, you can uh, definitely uh, think about like using new technology to synthesize. The, uh, the, the metabolites which can be used as, as medical, not to use the plant themselves, but to synthesize um, uh, in other ways. This is also the way to uh, preserve uh, 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 the plant species. You've published significant findings in 2019. Are you expecting more? There is much more to come. And very soon, we're writing up manuscripts, three or four, which also will show this new evolutionary scenario of horizontal gene transfer. And, and in one of those manuscripts, I hope we can show how these genes are not only functional, the bacterial genes, and they have changed the morphology and physiology of the host organism. And those genes that are responsible for this adaptation were brought into this organism by a DNA virus. Now the question is, where did the viruses get the bacterial genes from? That is a very interesting question because these viruses do not infect bacteria. They infect algae and plants and maybe animals and fungi. But bacteria can also reside inside algal cells and it's very likely that the virus picked up a bacterial gene from bacteria that have entered the algal cell.